Man has made himself the measure of all things, has assimilated the world to his finite humanity. This comes from the chapter Classical Man in Wilhelm Warringer's classic art historical work Form in Gothic. I'm going to read a few quotes from this chapter which explain the new stage in the psychological and cultural development which created Classical Man before reading the longer quote on the Greek column specifically, which comes at a later point in the book, where he compares Classical Greek and Gothic architecture. Art loses its transcendental, supersensuous coloring and becomes, like the Greek world of gods, an idealization of nature. The clear sculptural quality of the Greek world of gods is unthinkable without the security attained by this sensuous, intellectual insight. Art became this beautiful, stately product of refinement in the classical periods of human development. Classical man no longer suffered from the torturing relativity and uncertainty of the world of appearances, from the torments of perception endured by primitive man. The regulating and adjusting activity of his mind had sufficiently controlled the arbitrariness of the phenomenal world to give free play to his enjoyment of life. As universal piety, according to Goethe's meaning, developed from universal fear, so a vital impulse for empathy developed from a powerful impulse for abstraction. To him, artistic activity means fixing in visible form the ideal process whereby he accords his own sensibility to the living world around him. He no longer avoids the casualness of phenomena, but merely chastens them to an organically smooth orderliness. The feeling for beauty in living things, for the joy-inspiring rhythm of the organic world, has awakened. Ornament, which formerly was just orderliness, not expressing anything but the inevitable, the invariable, and therefore without any direct expression at all, now becomes a living, energetic movement, an ideal play of organic tendencies freed from all purpose. It resolves itself entirely into expression, and this expression is the life lent by man from his own store of vitality to forms which are inanimate and unmeaning in themselves. This transference of feeling, empathy, reveals to classical man the pleasures of contemplation. At this classical stage of human development, creative art consists in the ideal demonstration of conscious and chastened vitality. It becomes an objectified sense of one's enjoyment. I'm now going to read the section on the Greek column. Quote, if we seek for the architectural member most peculiar to classical architecture, the column immediately presents itself for our consideration. What determines the impression made by the column is its roundness. This roundness at once evokes the illusion of organic vitality because it directly reminds us of the roundness of those natural limbs which exercise a similar function of support and more specifically of the tree trunk, which supports the crown, and of the flower stalk, which bears the flower. Besides which, roundness in itself satisfies our natural organic feeling without the need of evoking analogous ideas. We cannot look at anything round without inwardly realizing the process which created that roundness. We seem, as it were, to realize the certainty, devoid of all violence, with which the centripetal forces concentrated in the center that is to say, the axis of the pillar, hold the centrifugal forces in check and steady them. We are conscious of the drama of this happy balance. We feel the self-sufficiency of the column, the eternal melody which throbs within its roundness. We feel, above all, the calm which evolves from this perpetual self-contained movement. Thus the column, like the circle, is the highest symbol of self-contained and perfected organic life. But these are feelings awakened by the column as a single member, quite apart from its structural function. These feelings are intensified when we consider the column as a member in a structural organism. The structural function of the column is naturally that of support. This function would naturally be equally well performed by a rectangular supporting member. Therefore, tectonically, the round column is not necessary, but surely it is artistically necessary that is to say, in the sense of the classical idea of form, for to it falls the task of expressing the function of bearing, of making it perceptible, that is to say, making it directly comprehensible to our organically determined feeling. 
To this organic faculty for visualization, the rectangular column would be an inanimate mass utterly impenetrable to our feeling for vitality, to our organic power of imagination. But this imaginative power is at once awakened by the round column, experiencing the drama of forces of which this bearing and supporting member is the scene. The preponderance of vertical extension, overextension and width is already decisive. If we wish to interpret this difference in dimension in an organic sense, we may say that the activity of the coalescence is subordinate to the activity of the self-lifting effort. We feel how the column draws itself together, concentrates all its forces from all sides onto the axis in order to exert with all its force the vertical uplifting energy condensed in the axis. In short, we feel how it carries. There can be no clearer, more convincing, more satisfying expression of assured, effortless support than that presented by the column. With a rectangular support, we should only be able to assert that it was supporting, because the result would convince us of the fact. But in this case, we feel it, we believe it. Here it has an aspect of necessity, because it is imposed upon our organic imagination. Warringer also explains here how the vertical grooves going up and down the column, or fluting, also emphasize the vertical feeling. If this fluting went around the column horizontally, it would convey an impression of collapse or yielding beneath the burden, instead of an impression of easy self-lifting. In that case, Warringer writes that the passive function of burden would then be more strongly emphasized than the active function of support, and the expression of freedom would be impeded. He concludes this moment by saying that the Greek will to form, which represents the harmonious classical consciousness of unity between man and the outer world, and culminates in the representation of organic life, also exerts itself in the endeavor to transform all tectonic necessity into organic necessity.